Uh, folks, we, today we've got uh, Paul Asadorian and Nicholas Curran from Security Weekly. Uh, Paul Asadorian is the founder and CEO of Security Weekly, where he has led the content and production of one of the longest-running computer security podcasts and internet TV shows. By day, he's a product strategist for Tenable Network Security. Paul produces and hosts the various shows at Security Weekly, all dedicated to providing the latest security news, interviews with the industry's finest, and technical how-to segments. Paul has extensive experience in penetration testing, embedded security systems, and hacking all the things. Uh, <clears throat> Nick Curran is a security geek, philosophy geek, and a producer for Paul's Security Weekly. <coughs> he enjoys poetry, music, and tea, and his speaker bio includes the phrase, est culos quod cogo salienum loqui latinae, hey, which basically means he's a jerk because he makes people like me, and it should say amicus, thank you, not no, I'll get it, but uh, 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 make strangers speak Latin. So, yeah. anyway, without further ado, put your hands together. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming to our talk. I know it's kind of late, and people want to get dinner and stuff. Uh, I promise to be as entertaining as I possibly can. Um, I Well, I started by adorning myself in unicorn. So, uh, this is uh, Nick Curran. Uh, Nick, you've never presented before never, in front never. of an audience, so uh, I'm very. It's awesome to, well, to have you I, up here. You know, have you to thank for that? So. Yeah. So we did a, a project together. Uh, Nick started working for me a little while back, and uh, I was the chief insecurity architect in the project that we're going to release during this talk today, uh, called "Intentionally Vulnerable Wireless Router Firmware Distribution IV Wert." Nick was the insecurity engineer. So uh, we worked really well together to come up with uh, this really cool firmware that has a lot of vulnerabilities. Before we get to the technical details in Nick's demo, I'm just going to kind of set the stage as to where I think we're going in terms of embedded device security, why the problem is so bad, um, some of the things that I've tried in the past that haven't really been working so well, um, and that will lead into like why we created this vulnerable firmware and some of the things that we put in it. We've already taught it at Black Hat for two days. This is the first time we're releasing anything public about it. Um, so you can go to iv-wrt.com and you can get access to our GitHub if you get bored during the talk. So um, uh, they did an introduction for me. Like I smoke cigars and drink scotch, and I go on the camera and I talk about security, and they call it a podcast. So that's kind of fun. Um, so I used to start my talks and say, you know, who cares if you hack the toaster, right? Everyone for years was always like, you're going to have Linux on your toaster, and then someone's going to care about the security someday. And I was like, no one cares about security on your toaster. I'm here today to tell you that I now care about having a toaster that's really cool, and I do care about the security. Because someone created a toaster, and it's called Jammy. Now, it's just a proof of concept toaster. However, Jammy is a Wi-Fi toaster that connects out to the internet to get the weather report and then burns the weather report on your toast in the morning. How have I lived without this device all of my life? I will never know. But I want security for the internet of things because I want a jammy. And then you do too now, don't you? You're all sitting there going, yeah, like, I want my weather on my toast, right? I want to hack it, you know, so it says, you know, send me a quote or equal one equals one. You know, I want to put, you know, cross-site scripting on my toast. That would be a lot of fun too. So I, you will care that your toaster is hacked, and you will care because you will want a jammy toaster. And, I mean, this just kind of speaks to how lots of people have hopped on the IoT train. There are tons and tons of devices, a lot of them in my own home. Um, in fact, we lost power uh, at my house. I live in uh, Rhode Island. We had a nasty storm that knocked out power for the past few days. And my wife and I have been texting and uh, trying to figure out when power is going to be restored to our home. And as I was leaving the bar coming to the talk, that's kind of tradition, uh, I got a message from my smart things, and it says, hey, your smart hub thing is back online. And I sent my wife a note. I said, you have power back. And like I knew before my wife, who may not have been home, because of all the smart devices in my house. And I mean, there's just lots of reasons why we are going to have more technology in our homes that we're going to care about the security. When something dies, we're going to replace it with something with an embedded system with Wi-Fi that connects to the cloud. It's just a fact. I can't wait 
from my toilet to shit the bed, so to speak, because there are toilets with Wi-Fi and heated seats and warming dryers and warming, you know, bidet things inside of them. And I want to connect it to Twitter so that you all know exactly what's happening. I feel it's important to keep my subscribers abreast of what's happening with the toilet. So, uh, old technology will be replaced by new technology that will further the Internet of Things. <clears throat> Security is still heading here on the IoT train. We've seen more vulnerabilities this year, I think, than ever before. As I was putting my course slides together for our embedded device security class, someone released on full disclosure 60 vulnerabilities across 22 different devices. Guess what? They're the same vulnerabilities we've heard about since 2003, when the first CSERF vulnerability was released on the WRT54G. Guess what? They're the same vulnerabilities that we're talking about when they're going to talk about car hacking at Black Hat. They're the same ones on IV pumps that Billy Rios discovered and then got sick and got in the hospital and woke up next to the same IV pump that he did a security assessment on and found horrible security. They're all the same classifications of vulnerabilities. I'll go through the whole class of 10 of them very quickly for this presentation. And it kind of leads into why we created our own wireless router vulnerable distribution so that we could work with the same class of vulnerabilities and show people just how bad they really are. So what does the Internet of Things mean? I mean, it means like things, like devices, but it also means the Internet of Things. And the internet means a lot of things to a lot of people. I mean, to some people it means a series of tubes as kind of a throwback, right? But it means a lot of things to a lot of people. The internet means cloud and cloud computing. So when we talk about the internet of things, not only are we talking about the devices that you and I all know and love that have electronics and run Linux, we're talking about cloud. We're talking about software, which doesn't have bugs, right? It has features. We're talking about mobile devices. We're talking about wireless technology. The Internet of Things encompasses all of these different technologies. And guess what? We have to secure all these different technologies when we talk about securing the Internet of Things. The scary part about this talk is I'm only going to talk about the security of the device itself, not the security of all these other technologies that bring these devices together. So I guess that means we should go to the bar now. Um, that's really one option. I'm all for going to the bar afterwards because I kind of want to finish my talk, but um, yeah, it's pretty depressing when I start thinking about the security of the Internet of Things and I look at all the areas we have to secure. Um, really quick, right, when we talk about an IoT device, we're talking about just this thing in this presentation. There's the browser that interfaces with some kind of web application. There's your mobile device that has an app that interfaces with another application. That application all runs in the cloud, and there are tons and tons of fail layered inside this Internet of Things. However, we're just talking about the device itself. So what is a device thing? It's a special purpose system for which the computer completely encapsulates the device it controls, or is completely encapsulated by the device it controls. This means when you go to your washer or dryer, right, you're not breaking out a shell and opening up a web browser. Well, I mean, maybe some of you are, and that's really cool, and we should talk later. But most of us go up to our washer to do what? Like tell it the temperature of the water, how fast to spin the clothes, put the soap in. That's how we're interfacing with our washer. Now, underneath, there's a computer, but the function of the washer is completely hidden by the computer. So we're not talking about cell phones and laptops necessarily, right, because they're more like computers. We're talking about lots of different devices. Who can tell me what all the devices on this slide have in common? Stop, you've seen this before. You're ruining it. What was that? Internet connected? Microcontroller, sort of. I have them all in my house. That's really, <laughs> so I don't know how people have lived without a SkyDrop, which controls your sprinkler system. Does anyone else have the sprinkler system they can control their smartphone? One person, right? How do the rest of you live in society without a smartphone connected IoT device that talks into the cloud that lets you program your sprinkler system? It's awesome. Weeds, no lawn, yeah. <laughs> AstroTurf, that's how I live, Paul. Um, 
But these are consumer embedded mobile cloud things, as I call them. So all of these devices are embedded systems, but they have a cloud component. So when I configure my Nest thermostat, it talks out to the cloud. I configure an app on my phone. It also talks to the cloud. And then I can talk to my thermostat together. I don't have to poke holes in my firewall. I don't have to do a lot of fancy security things. I rely on the cloud for my security with all of the devices that are up here, which I know for us is scary, as I just mentioned. But for the average person at home, they don't have to poke holes in their firewall as you do with a lot of these devices as well. These, oh wow, I'm a real nerd. These are also devices I have in my home. Um, this was the 2013 Christmas gift to my wife. It was a treadmill. What? She wanted a treadmill. And this is the 2014 Christmas gift with the scale. I mean, that's a nice, see, she, anyway. Um, so, these devices don't always talk to the cloud. These are standalone devices. If you want to access them remotely, you have to open up a firewall rule. Now, I'm going to tell you a really scary story. I don't know if it fits here in the presentation, but I'm going to tell it anyway, because it's one that we built universal plug and play into intentionally vulnerable um, wireless router project that we're working on. So I run the uh, wireless network and the internet um, uh, connectivity for the cigar lounge that's our next door. We have an arrangement. One of the things I do as part of that arrangement to get free cigars and stuff is I take care of their network. They were switching providers from Cox to Verizon. They have a DVR system that sits on the network that they have to poke a hole in the firewall to get access to remotely. So Verizon comes in, they drop off the new router, I reconfigure all of the other things first, I get everything working, and the manager of the cigar lounge goes, well, let me go on my phone. He's like, oh, from the outside, I can hit the DVR. I'm like. What do you mean you can hit the DVR? He's like, good job, Paul. You fixed it. I'm like, no, dude. I didn't do anything. I don't know what you're talking about, and I'm really freaked out right now. So I go on the router, and I look, and it's like, oh, universal plug and play already opened up those firewall rules for you. What? Oh, my God. That's frightening. So uh, we built that into IVWare, and I think that it's a really scary thing for me because when we look at, uh, when we talk about some of the botnets and just how large they've grown, if someone figures out how to exploit this hole to get more people to essentially drop shields in this manner, you're going to see much, much larger botnets that are comprised of embedded devices. Um, these are some consumer things I want. Luna's a really awesome bed. Like, it can wake you up, and it has, like, heat and massage. It's really awesome. I talked about the toilet. Um, I mean, I figure I got everything else, so I might as well have my crock pot tell me when it's done, because, I mean, why not? So uh, door locks, refrigerators. OK, so we should be, uh, the refrigerator is interesting, and the televisions are interesting, because I've always theorized that people will start caring about the security of these things when it impedes upon them from using these things. So when they get hacked, and what happens when you get hacked from a consumer perspective, right? You get pop-up ads, pop-up ads. When you start seeing those on your television and your refrigerator, you're going to be really freaking annoyed by that. And they're going to call one of you, right? Who, how many people here are technical support for their family? Yeah, like everyone in the room, right? So when people first started calling you and were like, I can't get to my porn sites because there's pop-ups. This is bad. I need antivirus software, right? They called you. So I truly believe that in the future when your refrigerator, when your television starts integrating these ad systems, Vizio announced it last week they're integrating an ad system into their TV. This is coming. I think evil bad guys are going to take advantage of it. So expect the call sometime soon. OK, so we should be here. Technology is being provided faster and cheaper than ever, right? Embedded devices are everywhere. They solve problems. My irrigation issues are totally solved by a smartphone app and an Internet of Things device. It's beautiful. Um, we're going to see more embedded devices as we replace old things. Except for Jack, we would never try and upgrade him. He's old. He can stay that way. It's fine. We love him just the way that he is. That's my one old joke in Sahaha. Ha ha, Paul made it funny. OK, ha ha, thank you, thank you. OK, so it's a train about to crash, and all the passengers are unaware or simply don't care at this point because it hasn't impacted people's lives, right? I get a wireless router. I get a Nest. 
I am completely unaware of the security uh, challenges that I face because I haven't been exposed to it. Nothing bad has happened in their eyes. I haven't gotten the slew of pop-ups that I normally get. So I think we're in a very scary place right now. I really think we need to start raising awareness. So I used to present this as you know the 10 most wanted list, and I thought that embedded device manufacturers would pay attention and be like, oh, Paul said we should do these 10 things or not do these 10 things as the case may be, so we should really listen to Paul. No one really listened and it didn't really work out. But there are still 10 things, mistakes, that I see that we're making in embedded security today, or in security as it were. So I want to present them in a slightly different light and talk about some of the bad things. We still see firmware backdoors. The most prolific, if you search for firmware backdoor on Google, you get Joel's backdoor. Okay, I go into excruciating detail of Joel's backdoor. It's not quite what you think. It's a D-Link router vulnerability that allows you to set a specific user agent and authenticate to any device running this firmware. Probably one of the most famous backdoors in like firmware or embedded device history. Uh, it's a really cool vulnerability, but it represents a huge problem that we have, that firmware and embedded devices have inside of them credentials that we all know about. And if we all know about them, there's no security to any of these devices. They put these in here for support reasons and whatnot. Ed Scotus made a great suggestion on the Security Weekly Show a couple of weeks ago. He said there needs to be a standard for authentication on embedded systems. And I truly believe that, that if we can develop a standard and have a secure protocol and a secure mechanism to manage and maintain our systems, we won't need to put in firmware backdoors. <clears throat> Default credentials, lots and lots of examples of default credentials. Um, a couple of different uh, examples I like to point to. A little while ago, you know, 2012, there was a 420,000 node botnet called the Karna botnet. It ripped to the internet by guessing credentials over Telnet. And, you know, this is, it's kind of sad. Um, do I talk about, um, okay. So yeah, the Karna botnet was default credentials on embedded systems. I mean, these just simply shouldn't exist. The user, I've been saying for years, should set the initial password on their router. It's not being done today, as evidenced by this 420,000 node botnet that was put together to basically scan the internet. Now, the scary part for me is what if we couple this with the universal plug and play? So today, there's 420,000, or in 2012, there's 420,000 devices that have default or weak credentials on them and we can build a botnet that size. What if we were to start propagating out malware that through universal plug and play, another weakness on these devices, was able to open up all of these ports and tell them to drop shields? Would that number double, triple, quadruple? I think we'd have a serious problem on our hands. So that's one of the reasons why I like to advocate for default credentials. Hopefully we can get some embedded device manufacturers to listen to us. Insecure Remote management is another area. Again, now we talked about default credentials, but now we're talking about them over Telnet. Why are we still using Telnet? This just goes back to the whole premise that Ed brought up, Ed Scotus brought up on the show that we need a secure way to interface with these systems. This includes the protocol. This includes the actual username and password itself, not being default, not having a backdoor. All that ties together in what we need to recommend to everyone to have, be able to authenticate to these devices, to be able to use them and be able to manage them. So the moose worm uh, was released in 2015 and infected 50,000 router, uh, routers with default Telnet credentials. Open source drivers, uh, it's kind of a little stretch in the security. It's really one of my pet peeves, uh, mostly from working with WOT54G routers. You know, they've got a binary blob, uh, Broadcom gives you a binary blob, and you build an open source operating system around this binary blob. If you need to update your operating system and the open source components, you can't because that binary blob is tied to whatever kernel version you know it was compiled with or whatever the case may be. So I think it really holds us back security-wise, and I really uh, like to advocate for open source drivers when we talk about embedded systems. I still, to this day, take apart firmware of very modern devices and find functions prone to overflow. 
We're talking S printf. We're talking star copy. It's there. In fact, in um, earlier this year, Craig Hefner, who's one of my idols, awesome firmware reverse engineer, um, he found that D-Link had an S printf overflow and never fixed it. In fact, they had a vulnerability in their firmware. They tried to fix it. They didn't fix the vulnerability, but in trying to fix the vulnerability, introduced another vulnerability. It just shows you the state of where embedded device companies are in terms of security. They lack a fundamental understanding. I think we need some posters, right? I respect myself. That's why I refuse to use sprintf. Using sprintf is a decision you can never take back. Maybe they need to hang some of those up in the office. I don't know. Firmware signing is still a problem to this day. Um, it makes updates harder to backdoor. Many of the devices that we're talking about today, they fall into a couple different categories. They could not, they could allow you to update the firmware, but it's a totally manual process. You have to go do it. And there's no validation that the firmware you're installing is actually from the manufacturer. So then they kind of wisen up, right? And they're like, wow, we should really make it easier for the user. So we're just going to do automatic updates. And they do automatic updates and the users are happier because they don't have to do anything. But they forget to validate that the firmware should be signed or, you know, use some kind of weak signing. And then we say, well, you know, you should really have strong signing. And then they start signing their drivers. Tesla is one of those companies. Um, I, I don't think, is it? Oh. I got a little bit ahead of myself, but uh, Belkin is one of the uh, bad companies in this respect because um, <clears throat> as was reported last year, um, Belkin Waymo firmware images are used to update the devices, are signed with public key encryption to protect against unauthorized modifications, right? So they're like, yes, we need firmware updates. Yes, we have to make it easier for the user. Yes, we need to do this security thing. The problem is the signed key and the password are leaked in the firmware that's already installed on the device, which means if I can pull the firmware off the device, I can get all the signing keys and it kind of makes it a mute, uh, 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 null point. So um, that was last year that we started talking about that. Um, speaking of user friendly, Tesla, who makes like really cool geeky cars for us, like awesome stuff, right? Um, they've got a big advantage over today over most of the car manufacturers. Uh, I was actually just speaking with someone who was very close to this issue. <clears throat> he said they've come a long way. Tesla will do an over-the-air update that does proper signing. I mean, they use SSL, but OK. At least they're trying, right, to do an over-the-air update that um, is secure. It doesn't require the user to visit a dealership or put a USB key in their car. So Tesla's one of the ones doing it right. BMW is also on that list of manufacturers that just recently are doing it right. And this is what I mean by making it user friendly, easy for the user. The user shouldn't have to be involved. If we have to go to users and say, hey, you should update your firmware, you're already lost. They don't know what firmware is. The average person driving a car doesn't know what firmware is as it relates to their car. They have no idea. So we need to make this process as easy for the end users as possible. There are some companies leading the way, which is great. A lot of the uh, issues with embedded systems center around the web management interface. And the web management interface, you know, sometimes I'll pull my class, I'm like, has everyone ever written a web server like from scratch in C? Has anyone done that before? Yeah, is it fun? No, it's horrible, right? So when someone does it, they're like, oh, is that open source? Can we have a copy of that? And then if that has a vulnerability in it, it just gets copied from device to device to device to device because it's a pain in the butt to write. It's not the right way to implement a web framework on an embedded system. This is another area where I really want to advocate for standards. I want people to have a secure web framework that if they're, hey, I'm building a Linux embedded device or I'm building a VxWorks embedded device, whatever it is, I want to put a web interface on it give them a secure framework to start off with, give them a fighting chance to build something secure. A lot of the vulnerabilities that we've traced over time that we've built into IVWRT are very much web related. When you start linking them together, as we'll show you in our demo, please sacrifice something for the demo gods, we're going to show you that linking them together is really bad. And 
Um, remember I said there was those uh, 60 vulnerabilities in 22 routers? A lot of those in common had the CSERF vulnerability we're going to show you, coupled with the authentication bypass, coupled with command injection. That's a lethal combination. It's not one that we made up. Today, devices have these vulnerabilities, and that's why we want to show them to you uh, in a controlled environment. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, in, in that particular one that was gone to full disclosure, a lot of these vulnerabilities didn't get fixed. A lot of these manufacturers aren't listening to researchers and fixing problems. They don't have a cert. They don't have a bug bounty program. I think they'd be afraid as to how much money they'd have to pay out, like D-Link, to have to pay out in order to fix all, you know, discover all these bugs and then finally fix them. So um, my other recommendation to embedded device manufacturers, maintain a cert, have a bug bounty program, do that stuff. Don't ignore researchers that are disclosing flaws and have a process for it. Uh, again, we talked about uh, universal plug and play a little bit. There are essentially a lot of protocols, and these protocols aren't just on consumer wireless gear, right? There's uh, BACnet, which is building automation, which has no security built in by, by default at all. There's Modbus, which when I talk to some of my friends about Modbus, say that to call Modbus a protocol is an insult to all other protocols. And again, represents something with no authentication. Universal plug and play is the same thing. Okay, so <clears throat> despite my best attempts of getting people to hear my 10 complaints and embedded device manufacturers and IoT and even car manufacturers making one or more of the 10 mistakes that I just put up there on the board, despite me talking about them for some time, kind of frustrates me, and I feel like we need to raise awareness even more. I said, you know, we have vulnerable web apps, we have uh, vulnerable on purpose Linux distributions, we don't really have vulnerable on purpose embedded routers. And so we went through this kind of long rigmarole of, well, maybe we need to find an old piece of hardware that has vulnerabilities on it. Yeah, those are the vulnerabilities we need to show people and do some demonstrations. And they're like, well, I ordered one, but it was Rev D, not Rev A, and Rev A has the vulnerability. So, well, that didn't work. Well, I need to find this particular version of firmware for this old Linksys device that I have, because that has a lot of the vulnerabilities that we like. And, and we can show people how bad it is. And then I write Linksys on Twitter and open up support tickets, and they're like, no, you can't have any of the old firmware when we pulled on the download site. I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't help me either. Then you go try and find old firmware on the internet, and you get malware, and you have to rebuild your VMs, which really sucks. So then I'm really frustrated, and I'm like, that's it. We need to just build our own. We need to control our own environment. So I don't know if I start out with, uh, okay, so I'll talk about it here a little bit. Uh, we actually started out with DDWRT. Yeah, don't, don't ever look at the DDWRT web interface code unless you have like dull spoons to gouge your eyes out afterwards. Really, really bad. Um, so then we turned to OpenWRT and I drew this big whiteboard uh, in the office where, where Nick and I work and I said, um, these are all the vulnerabilities I want. Like, after everything I've seen with all of these devices across all of these different industries, not just wireless routers in people's houses, but things that are on IV pumps, things that are in cars, things that are in basically anything that we classify as an embedded device, here's what I want you to start doing. So I drew it the whiteboard, and then, you know, as time went on through six to eight months, Nick would come in my office and be a glorious time, and he put like this little check mark, and we'd like rejoice, yay, we have C-Surf, yay, which normally we don't rejoice unless we're on a pen test like that, but so yeah, so we rejoiced every time there was a vulnerability until we had this full list of vulnerabilities. Now, those of you that worked with OpenWord before, what do you get when you log into OpenWRT on the command line? Anyone? Yeah, busy box, but what's the message that comes up when you log in? What is it? Yeah, it's a drink recipe, right? So it's like, even better, I get to come up with a drink recipe for IV work. And I said, it's got to be a Bloody Mary, because how else to describe an intentionally vulnerable wireless router 
distribution than a, it's a Bloody Mary because it's, I mean, it's a hot mess. Um, it's a bloody mess, basically, is what we made out of Open Word after we ripped it apart. So it's a pretty fitting name. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll share with you my Bloody Mary recipe. So that's like a bonus you get in the talk. Okay. So like I said, finding vulnerable hardware and software was hard. Vulnerable firmware is no longer available. Make sure hacking attacks difficult. Um, yeah, a stable environment to develop exploits is tough too, like running things in emulation from other firmwares, running firmware in other emulation is a gigantic pain in the butt and is only going to get you like one example. Now we can control everything. Um, again, the goal is to raise awareness in the community, get all of you working with this firmware to be able to use it, to understand it, to see how vulnerabilities work, to see how vulnerabilities interact with each other is really important so that you can understand these problems even better so that you can go to the, all of the vendors and manufacturers of the IoT gear and work with you know, the bug crowds of the world, responsibly disclose these vulnerabilities to help improve the security of IoT, which is a complete train wreck. Okay, so we built an authentication bypass, um, which is kind of funny because the, the root uh, shadow file is right on the view source of the main page. And you think that like that, you'd never see that. It exists out there, okay? There is firmwares that disclose the admin password in the source. So we replicated that. There's backdoor accounts, command injection, cross-site scripting, reflected and stored cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, a really funny token spoofing thing that just kind of like came about as we were putting vulnerabilities in there. It's kind of lame. Um, it was by accident. Basically, you can spoof anyone's token. If they're logged in, you can send their token if they're already logged in. Um, but the CSRF plus the authentication bypass makes that kind of uh, moot point. Uh, universal plug and play is also on there as well. Um, so we have, you know, like a little script. You run a command. It sends a command to IVWIRT to open up port 80 on the WAN port to essentially drop shields to its management interface on the, on the external internet. Okay, now I'm going to turn over to Nick Curran, who's going to talk about how he was able to, like where in the code some of these vulnerabilities are and how the vulnerabilities present themselves, and then uh, give a little demo. So, turn over to Nick. Sure, thank you. Do you need some Vaseline <laughs> before you go on? All right. Not, you're good, you're good. Okay. maybe later. Okay. <laughs> So uh, you look at the code <laughs> up there, actually, uh, Lucy, the Lua Unified Configuration Interface is, um, <clears throat> for open word is actually um, a lot like a web framework. And so there's a root node, and each uh, page inherits <clears throat> attributes from that node. So if you look, um, you have to set uh, authentication to false explicitly. So that's our. An, an authentication bypass. Um, and basically, you don't really notice yet, but you should, if you're logged in, have a session token in your URL. So that's our authentication bypass. Um, this is a backdoor. That's the source of the login page. Um, this is <clears throat> our command injection. Um, if you look, it says Etsy, back quote, echo, PWD, cut C1. Um, this actually gets passed uh, as a URL, so we needed a way to make forward slashes. Uh, so what we did is just echoed the present working directory and cut everything but the first character off. Which, I mean, it's pretty standard. In most command injections, you're limited in some kind of way. So we were also limited, so it was kind of cool to... There's actually a couple of different ways Nick discovered later how to work around that limitation of not being able to just put a forward slash in. So you can actually create a file and then cat that file to create that forward slash. But it's a pretty realistic interpretation of a command injection because it has limitations like all their command injections do. This is the C surf. It's beautiful. It's a, it's a, yeah. Nick created this slide and I'm like, this is a beautiful C surf. He's like, it's just a bunch of guys. He's like, it's not. I'm like, no, dude, it's beautiful. It's awesome. Look at how beautiful it is. Sorry. Um, and so this is the the vulnerable code. When I went through, I left everything in. I just commented certain things out. So the code in red is just checking to make sure that uh, the token that's been passed is the appropriate token. Um, but it's commented out. It, Nick makes it look really easy. Like, you know, you just, you go through the code and then you comment those two lines out and look, you've got CSERF. But 
it took you a lot longer than yeah, yeah. five minutes to like go into the code and feel like the ultimate way we, you know, Nick was able to inject the vulnerability was those two lines ended up commented out. But it was like weeks of us testing and theorizing and going through source code to get there. So uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is what I'll show you. Um, and I'll probably show you a little more. But this is just a, a kind of scary situation that could happen. I mean, you Did you want me to walk them through the? If you like. Yeah. So I was like, there's a user. They have antivirus and a firewall. So they're like, I'm safe. Yay. And I can call one of you nerds if I ever get in trouble. So I'm just going to browse the internet like there's no regard for any security. And then um, they load a page that has a CSERF vulnerability for the device that they're using. Now, since there's authentication bypass, that CSERF is very effective. They don't have to be logged into the router because there's an authentication bypass vulnerability. The authentication bypass vulnerability happens to be on a page that we chose that is also vulnerable to command injection. The command injection vulnerability can then put malware and essentially shovel a shell back to the attacker. So just by the fact that the user is loading a page, it goes through all those vulnerabilities in a single click and puts malware not on the user's workstation, but on their router. This means now I have root command privileges on their router. Actually, the web server runs as root, so when it shovels a shell back to me, I get a root prompt um, back when they shovel me the shell, which means I can put any malware I want on there. I can change your DNS servers. I can sniff your traffic. I can do whatever I want on that router that's passing traffic for all of your devices. So this was kind of the scenario we came up with. This is just walk them through it again. I don't know if you just want to do it live or what. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, let's do some demo. <clears throat> okay. All right, it's so. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, we've already started IVWirt and an attack server. Um, one of the things we'll have to do is log in and set a password. All right, so I'm logged in, so I'll assume the role of the victim. Our attack server is here. I'll click. Of course, we could hide that. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that, but set applying changes. And now we've you're, got it. You're working, working on hiding that in an iframe. Right, exactly, yeah. yep. Um, and so now we've got a new firewall rule here. So 172.30.254.1 is the LAN side. And the WAN side is on the 10 network. So if we go here, I probably should have shown you before that uh, actually what I can do is just delete this rule. You have to save and apply. Yeah. I do have to save and apply. That's right. And, oh. Uh, what's that? Click the little arrow thingy next to the little, yeah, that one. I don't like that. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually not connected. It says connecting to, and it's just spinning. Right, exactly. So um, just to show you guys, I'll do that again. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it's probably uh, <laughs> the demo gods frowning. It worked the first time. You it, pushed uh, it by trying I'm to make it work again. I'm very confident that it'll work. <laughs> yeah. Um, Try closing that. Try closing all of them, and then just log in through the lane again. Sure. No, oh, I think we. Yeah, we host it. Beauty of embedded devices. But yes, I'm about to try turning it off and on again. <clears throat> so we'll have to uh, have to wait one second for the interface to boot up. Um, while we do that, Paul will probably talk about my Bloody Mary talk recipe. About his Bloody Mary recipe. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, so that's my Bloody Mary recipe. Couple of things to know about the Bloody Mary recipe. Four ounces V8 juice, four ounces vodka. Very important, half and half equal mixture. The other secret ingredient in there is pickle juice. Very important, okay? Make it as spicy as you want. Um, also, celery bitters, Worcestershire sauce. You need to have all the right ingredients to make Paul's Bloody Mary. It'll come out awesome, I promise. That's all I had on my Bloody Mary. Sure. I don't know how long I could have stretched my Bloody No, that Mary was uh, that pretty good? quick, and I okay. think we'll be all right. So we'll go to the land side. That looks right. better. you got to yeah. set your password again. We have to set a password again. I apologize. All right. Now let's check out the WAN, and we can't get there. Now we'll go back to our attack server. We'll click that link. We've got our new rule. And we can get there from the WAN. Yay. Drop shields. Paul mentioned this earlier. Uh, Paul mentioned this earlier. Um, basically, there's, there's a, a symbolic link to a file which is just output into this. Um, I just did that to make it harder for our students to find. Um, <clears throat> there's also authentication bypass. What I can do is show you a script. Um, and what, oh, okay. Paul doesn't have uh, the Python modules that I need, but that's fine. Um, if I just go to admin network, Diagnostics. I think you spelled that work wrong. Yeah. I spelled it like very wrong. All right. <clears throat> We've bypassed authentication. Or I was logged out, right? Yeah. Just to show you guys. All right. There we are. Okay. And predictably, we've arrived at a ping utility. Uh, you can kill the reminder for my dinner. I have to go to sure. a little while. Thanks. For which. <laughs> for which there is command injection. <coughs> um, what I've also put up on the attack server is, oh, no, I didn't put that up. So uh, on the new attack server, I have uh, everything you need to basically implant a backdoor. Um, but I can kind of show you um, that, uh, that forward slash we were talking about. So that's how we get forward slashes. Um, because if I do something like that, it doesn't work. Um, and what should I do next? I'll probably. Uh, Cat's a shadow. Oh, I could do that, yeah. Spell that code wrong. Spelled Etsy wrong. Yeah, that's a password. And that's can you remember the shell off the top of your head? No, I I no. can't I can't do SHA one hashes in my head. Oh, it doesn't involve a SHA one hash. What? Okay. The back door, like can you run netcat? Is that how you did? Oh, I could do that too. What what I was talking about was uh, just writing directly to Etsy password and Etsy shadow. Um, so hopefully, oh here we go. Yeah. So I could show you. Uh, I could show you just a simple alert one, but hopefully we'll be able to do something a little more interesting. Um, if would well, you want to show them shovel in the shell? Can you set up a listener and do the shell through the? Um, well, you want to do that later if we have time? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So I'll log in. I'll go to system, system. So what I'm going to show you is a stored cross-site scripting attack. Um, <coughs> okay, that should work. And uh, it's in the hostname field. So 
That means a few things. Um, it has to be less than 64 bytes or 64 characters. It has to, uh, it can't contain dots, which is why I'm using the HTML entity codes. Um, and it also means that it shows up in every page because the um, host name of the box uh, appears in the title of the page. So hopefully, if I do log.txt and then I do something like watch cat.txt <coughs> and I log out and log back in. Well, that doesn't seem to have worked. Um, so what I'll have to show you for now is just the basic alert one. That could be. Okay. So you'll see. Yay, cross site scripting. Yay! Yeah. Yay! And it's on every single page. Um, Nick does have a keystroke logger working, but. Uh, Basically, about four hours ago, I completely hosed my system. So here we are. If you go to iv work.com, you can get all the documentation and it'll come complete with the JavaScript key logger. Uh, there's also examples on there how to use the command injection vulnerability to shovel a shell back to yourself um, and a bunch of other things as well. So uh, when you go to iv workcom today, you'll be able to download the ELF image and there's instructions on how to run that in emulation. Nick, I don't know if you want to show like really quick your IV work uh, script that we have. Sure. Um, but basically we're running the entire firmware distribution in emulation. And we have a pre-compiled binary out there that represents our firmware. Um, Nick will be working when we get back to upload all of his source code. So uh, OpenWRT uses build root. You'll be able to compile this vulnerable firmware for any device that's supported by open work. Now, warning before you do that. It's intentionally vulnerable. Don't put this on anything internet facing or someone will pwn it. Um, we haven't done anything about this publicly, but we already noticed like someone was hitting, found us on GitHub and started writing articles about it. So, um, yeah, don't run this on anything production, public facing, basically anything that you don't want to get pwned, uh, don't run this on. Please. You support bug fixes. Yes. You, uh, well, not if they fix vulnerabilities, because those vulnerabilities aren't bugs, they're vulnerabilities, and they should be there. Reverse bug fixes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's the unfeature list. But if you want to uh, introduce new vulnerabilities, that would be awesome, which sounds really weird for me to say. <laughs> but that would be really awesome. Um, and so, as I was saying before, also Nick's going to work on getting all the source code up there as well. So it, it is fully open source. Everything we've done is open source. Um, again, I put that caveat out there, like, don't think this is like something you should run on production devices. Make sure you tell people, hey, there's an intentionally vulnerable wireless router firmware out there. Don't ever run it on your production systems. Like help spread the word to prevent people from doing that because I'm really kind of concerned about people running that. So you have the, uh, if you just want to run it in emulation, you have everything out there need today to, uh, to do that. And if you want to compile the source, compile it for other platforms or hardware, you want to have a physical Raspberry Pi running a vulnerable IV wart distribution, you can do that. Um, so, now, any questions for Nick and I? I think that's too cool. Uh, <coughs> how, do, how do you suppose the CNN articles are going to read on this? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't think they care that much. <laughs> uh, the other one being, uh, is the appliance going to be made available? Appliance? Uh, the appliance that you guys have, do you guys have a ready made one? Yeah, so you can, uh, you can take the ELF file, it's basically uh, the full firmware image, and just in one QMU command, you can run that and get the full virtual image. And then there's full documentation with all our scripts. Like all the scripts that Nick was running for the attack server and stuff like that are all being released open source. Right. Yeah, so you'll have access to everything. You should look through uh, the documentation a little bit. In order to set up the LAN side and the WAN side, um, what we do for the class is basically uh, uh, tap a dummy and a bridge. So that Yeah, all that documentation on how to configure on your own as well. Yeah. We have a mic in the middle of the room if folks want to ask questions. Thank you.
No more questions? Not even about the unicorn? Are you going to be adding any vulnerabilities that show how your own devices can be attacked so that you can have something where, you, you know, you have, you have your mom, right, saying, I swear I wiped the system like you said and did the reinstall, how come I still keep on getting infected? You know, or something along those lines where you can show that it's, I don't know, but something so that show that, that if you see this persistent kind of thing, these are the impacts that people have that own these. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So the question is, you're going to show anything that's persistent that, you know, I wipe my system, but vulnerabilities are still there to showcase that. I think it's a really important point. I think that a lot of people think, hey, I'm pwned, you know, someone's in my bank account, something nefarious is happening. Let me wipe my Windows system and reinstall it. But now I still have the problems because someone pwned my router. So I would like to put components inside of this system that, um, you know, m maintain persistence, that do some packet sniffing, that do some attacks, that inject traffic uh, into the, you know, TCP streams to do things like that. Uh, and show persistence. It's a great point. I think you know we're all thinking along the same lines. The other thing I want to do, and I encourage others to do this too and share their research, you want to take this, you want to put it on the internet in a controlled environment and let people hack into it and see what they do and use it as a honeypot, I think that's great too. The more we can learn about how people are breaking in these systems, the better. So that's kind of what we have next too to answer that question is we're going to make some honeypots out of these systems and see what attackers think of them. Yeah, we've got all night. I mean, you know, the pool party's not for another. No, I don't. Didn't you see the alert that came up? <laughs> I, got, I got to go to a dinner. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we probably should have a rolling credit somewhere in there. Like a little Easter egg, if you go to a certain page on the web interface, you know, thank you, D-Link, for all of your inspiration. We love you. <laughs> All right, no, more other, uh, no further questions, then uh, have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.